No, I'm not Todd Horton. I'm Cliff, N4CCB, and I edited the video you're about to watch. Now, just a brief note. The recording is not perfect. Todd's presentation was fantastic. You're going to want to watch this, but the lavalier microphone battery died about three quarters of the way through, and so the audio toward the end isn't great, but it's still usable. The camera battery died just a minute or two before the presentation was over, and there's a place or two where Todd is pointing at the screen and talking about something, and I don't have a proper slide for what he's saying so I couldn't show that to you so it's not perfect but it's great and you're gonna really like this one I promise we'll do better next time and let's roll it I appreciate you all being here today welcome to the Public Safety Center some of what I'm going to present today may be old hat to some of you uh, but for others of you you may have not heard anything about emergency management and what our role is and what our purpose is or about the building that that you're presently in I know you meet here regularly uh, and sometimes you come into a meeting place and you know where it's located but you don't know anything about its capabilities or how it's how it's built so we'll talk a little bit about that as well so a lot of people ask what is emergency management oftentimes throughout the course of our our day when we're out in the public and they see our shirt with EMA they'll say what is EMA uh, most people don't have an understanding of it. They know what law enforcement is, EMS is, fire em is, but they don't know where EMA fits into the picture. And so basically emergency management is responsible for a whole community approach to planning for, responding to, and recovering from the disasters. So our mission statement, although it's a little long, is we, we, the we, mission of the Williams County Emergency Management Agency is to improve our county's resilience against all hazards by engaging the whole community in prevention, mitigation, response, and recovery, <clears throat> accomplished through collaborative partnerships, just like we have with this group here, that focus on emergency planning, development, and sustainment of emergency response organizations and programs, emergency communications and warnings, <clears throat> provision of capability enhancing equipment, developing and delivering training, and ongoing evaluations of both capabilities and our program efficacy. So our mission is that we have a vision for a prepared community. <clears throat> we believe that the more we prepare our community to recognize times of disaster, to respond effectively, and how to recover from those disasters, we will be more resilient and we will uh, recover faster. <clears throat> so we want to empower our people with knowledge. A lot of people understand sometimes what to do, but they don't feel empowered to be able to do it. We want to empower them to understand what they can do and how they can help not only themselves, their family members, but their neighbors as well, and ultimately the overall community. <clears throat> we have three core values that guide the members of our organizations. We want to have, first of all, quality. If we're not producing quality for our community, nobody's going to take value in what we have to offer. We also want to be a leader in the community. Uh, for a while now, and I say this tongue in cheek because I haven't been with the agency uh, but a little over two years, <clears throat> but I'll go back uh, as far back as the May 2010 flood, which probably many of you lived through and experienced. During the May 2010 flood, the Emergency Operations Center was not active in Williamson County. And the reason it wasn't active is because it, you'll see a picture in a little bit. It was located in the old hospital in the basement and it was dealing with flooding of its own. It was dealing not only with flooding in the emergency operations center, it was dealing with pipes breaking in the center that was causing sewage to come into the emergency operations center and the 911 center as well. And so by its very nature, the emergency operations center was handicapped in its ability to support the program. And so <clears throat> one of the things that I want the emergency management agency to do is to become a leader in, in this, in this uh, realm of disaster response and recovery and preparedness. So, um, I liken our agency uh, to, at one point, to being, if you picture a, a baseball game where you've got players, you've got coaches, you've got people in the stands. <clears throat> we don't want to be in the stands. We want to be the coach of the game. We want to be the one that's, that's leading the effort and making the difference in our community. And then, of course, we want to be innovative. <clears throat> uh, we are a very wealthy community here in Williamson County. And as such, we have the ability to do things that many other counties don't. Matter of fact, for instance, Williamson County Emergency Management employs 19 people in its emergency management agency. Many of our counties are lucky to have, they have to have one by state law, 
but in most, in many of those cases, they're even a part-time em employee as the emergency management director, or they share responsibilities as director of emergency management and maybe director of public works or director of the fire service or something else. So we're very blessed here in Williamson County to not only have the financial resources to have staff, we also have this beautiful building uh, that we work out of and the technology within this building is quite amazing. And then we have partners like this group that bring a whole wealth of other resources and information and knowledge and experience and expertise to the table to help us overcome communications challenges that we might face during times of disaster. We, we look for multiple ways to be able to do anything that we do here. <clears throat> and we, we try to take a four step process in order to do that. But we realize that different situations, for instance, like the bombing that happened on Christmas Day in Nashville, start to take out those levels of communication uh, throughout our community. And during this, this most recent incident, multiple 911 centers, as you know, across the state, lost all communication capabilities. And it took a little bit for us to restore even some phone lines within the system, but having this multiple tiered approach to emergency management and this multiple tiered approach to backups upon backups upon backups, it better prepares us. And you bring a unique perspective to that for our communications efforts. So a little bit about our agency. I told you about our 19 personnel. We have the director, we have our operations manager, which is basically the second in command here. We have a readiness coordinator who's also responsible for training. And as you know, readiness uh, in, in whatever you do, readiness is important. If you're not ready and prepared, the rest of it's gonna go pretty crazy. And so our readiness coordinator is responsible for making sure that all of our resources that we have here are always ready to go into action no matter what. Our, we, have, uh, we have three operations officers. Uh, one is responsible for grants, uh, our canine program. We have uh, three canines within our organization, all with a single handler that's able to do uh, various types of searches, live scent search, cadaver search, <clears throat> and so forth. We have search and rescue responsibilities also, uh, whether it's through the canine program or it's personnel search and rescue. And then we have another officer who's responsible for our hazmat program, our special operations program, and our uh, <clears throat> unmanned aerial systems program. So we have two drones within our organization, as well as we work closely in all of these uh, aspects with our cities and towns throughout Williamson County as well. And many of them have drones in their programs as well. And then we have two plans officers here. We just hired our second plans officer. This is a new position for us. Uh, plans officer is responsible for the creation of all of our plans or the maintaining of all of our plans. They don't necessarily do all of the work, but they coordinate all of that effort. And then this last plans officer we were able to hire is a COOP and COG coordinator. And that stands for continuity of operations and continuity of government. <clears throat> if we can't function as a government or we can't function in our operations day to day, we fail in times of disaster. And so this position is a newly created position for us that will work closely with our cities and towns throughout Williamson County to make sure that we have adequate plans in place to continue government and continue to, operation, to operate during disasters. We have our external affairs officer who's responsible for all of our public information. <clears throat> and we have communications and technology coordinator. Many of you probably know Sean Cothran, a, a very wealth of knowledge individual <clears throat> who's responsible to oversee our radio systems and our IT systems. Under him, we have a communications technology. Many of you are familiar with Butch Coulter, another extremely talented individual. And then we have our IT systems analysis. <clears throat> and we go down to our GIS specialist. Uh, GIS is geographical information systems. Those are the individuals who's responsible for all of our mapping that we do uh, during times of disaster. <clears throat> and we're, we're branching more and more into apps through Esri that allow us to collect real-time information from the field and, and put it into the emergency operations system as it's being collected. So one example that some of you have helped us with is monitoring of our tornado warning sirens or, or our outdoor warning sirens located throughout the county. You use a simple app to, <clears throat> to be able to record the information about the function of that siren, and we see that immediately as you're out there in the field collecting that information. Uh, we use it in times of disaster for things like damage assessment. So <clears throat> when the March floods come, come through as an example, 
we, we message the fact that this app is available. It's, it's accessible. You don't have to have an app. You can go through uh, the internet, any internet enabled device, whether it's the phone or computer, and you can fill out a quick survey to talk about the damage that you sustained uh, to your property uh, during that event. <clears throat> and so we're able to collect that real-time information from the public, which allows us to target resources to areas that are hardest hit and also to understand the impact and the magnitude of the event so that we know whether additional resources need to be called in or not. <clears throat> we also have our fire service coordinator and six administrative fire captains, and we'll talk about their role in just a second. And then we have our reserve program, which uh, several of you in this room are a part of our reserve program as well. So in the, in the fire service, uh, what a lot of people don't recognize in the unincorporated area of Williamson County is we're protected by all volunteers. <clears throat> the only, uh, only the cities and towns have paid firemen, and that's the city of Fairview, now the city of Nolensville, the city of Brentwood, and the city of Franklin. Uh, Thompson Station is still uh, provided by volunteers, <clears throat> and so we have... Uh, in order to supplement the volunteer fire service and to help them out in order to, to meet the mission that they have, we are blessed to have a fire coordinator and six fire captains. And these captains and coordinator are assigned to different volunteer fire stations throughout our county. And we help them first of all with recruitment and retention, getting people into the volunteer fire service and helping them stay here and be able to serve our community. We also are responsible for pretty much all of the purchasing of their apparatus and equipment. The county funds uh, both equipment and apparatus for the volunteer fire service. <clears throat> in, in recent uh, times, donations to the volunteer fire service continue to drop uh, across Williamson County and across the nation for that matter. And the reason, primarily the reason that is, is because many people don't realize that it's a volunteer organization. We have a lot of people that move in here for other communities and they've not been served by volunteer organizations, so they don't know that they exist. So the county is blessed to be able to help support that. We also uh, design and build their fire stations and build the EMS stations. And we provide, uh, we, we buy the ambulances that help provide uh, EMS service to our community. We provide training and education for that group. And we also respond and provide technical assistance to them. So during the day, volunteerism is usually lower because they're doing their full-time jobs. So these seven individuals help supplement the response during the day. For the emergency management proper side, we focus on five phases of emergency management. First of all, mitigation. We want to take actions to lessen the impact of any disaster that might strike our community. We also want to try to prevent. There are certain things that we can prevent. There are other things that we can't. We can't prevent a tornado from happening here, but hopefully we can do things to help lessen the impact of it, such as building codes and, and educating our people on how to properly respond in a tornado situation or to get to shelter if they don't have adequate shelter for where they live and other measures of that. Preparedness, always being ready for disasters, taking every measure that we can to prepare for and ask ourselves, what if this happened, what can we do? Of course, response when the time comes, and then recovery, returning as close to a pre-disaster state as we possibly can. So day to day, we're first of all about relationship building. If we're gonna organize a whole community effort in order to respond and prepare and recover from disasters, we must be building relationships. During times of disaster is not the time to learn and meet new people. It's not a time to understand what capabilities someone can bring to the table. So we must first and foremost be about building those relationships. <clears throat> of course, our programs that I talked about, not only our grant programs and our K-9 and our drone programs, but our interagency coordination. If we're not working with our cities and towns uh, and our utility partners and our faith-based organizations and others, we're behind the curve. We want to do planning, of course, with our community. Uh, our, we our, have a countywide emergency operations plan, but we also have other supporting plans like our hazard mitigation plan, our debris management plan, and many, many others. <clears throat> we have training. We do a wide range of federal, state, and local classes. And then, of course, we do response day to day, where we're responding out to tractor trailers that are overturned on the roadways that have chemical spills to, to be able to mitigate that and get that cleaned up properly and out of the way. During a disaster, our primary function and mission is running the emergency operations center, which is the room that you set in today. 
In Williamson County, and you'll hear me say this again later in the presentation, <clears throat> we don't have a lot of disasters here. We don't face a lot of big scale emergencies. <clears throat> and so uh, it's, it's more important for us to do exercises on a regular and continual basis to bring those groups of people into this room and to present scenarios that could happen in our community and, and work through the process of, of basically handling that incident. So when we have an exercise, this room is typically full with about 115 or so people. <clears throat> but most of our events that we experience are low level events and we'll talk about that in the next few slides. We also support and work with on scene commanders. We have field responders that can actually go to incident scenes to help coordinate with the incident commander to get the resources that they need or to solve a problem that exists for them. Some of you may have lived in this community when the tractor trailer truck hit the bridge on I-65 at Goose Creek and ended up requiring the total demolition of both of those bridges. A significant need existed for our community in that a portion of the city of Franklin for, for specifics was cut off from emergency services. And when I say cut off, I don't mean completely cut off because there were other ways to get to these areas but it changed a nine minute response into a 45 minute response if they would have had to go out 96 down Arno Road and Goose Creek and back through the back way. And so while we were on the interstate, it was immediately recognized that the loss of those bridges was going to create a significant emergency services challenge for us. And we began working immediately to establish a temporary uh, fire station. The fire department in, uh, in and of themselves would have not come to that conclusion. The law enforcement would have not come to that conclusion. The EMS would not have come to that conclusion. It's emergency management's responsibility to look at the whole collective picture and understand the needs that exist and come up with ways to overcome those challenges. And so we begin working with those individual partners and our county mayor and our uh, city leaders and determined that the Ag Center was the most appropriate place to open up that temporary fire police and EMS station. And that very day we did that and, and, and stationed resources on that side of town to at least get an initial response uh, into that area. <clears throat> Those are the things that we do and how we support incident commanders on the scene. We facilitate resource requests. Communities can very easily be overcome in disasters. Uh, while we have a great number of resources and emergency services here in Williamson County, it wouldn't take much to overwhelm those resources. If we look at Waverly right now in Humphreys County, you can imagine the overwhelming impact that this has had on their community. And they had resources coming in from multiple different locations and still, as a matter of fact, Monday, starting Monday, we're going to be sending from Williamson County, and that includes its cities, we're going to be sending about six dump trucks, a couple of track holes, and two um, knuckle boom trucks to help support continued debris removal in, that, in those communities. We have sent a number of other resources already in the past weeks uh, since that event happened. We also support hurricane response, well, response of any magnitude of any disaster across the United States. Uh, we recently just sent people uh, down to Louisiana, for instance, to help uh, communication support uh, for Task Force 2. Uh, so we're constantly available to send resources, but also we understand that we can be overcome uh, and need resource help here. So it's our job as emergency management to help facilitate those resource requests. We want to coordinate the community response, of course, and we serve as the mayor's representative and agents during a disaster. Whatever the mayor wants, that's our job to make happen across our community. So functions of an EOC, we're one community again here, cities and counties. Uh, this facility is meant to house us all and to bring us all into the room together. Uh, many of our cities and towns have credentials to be able to get into this building without even our staff having to be here. That's how important this center is and its operation during times of disaster. We also have the EOC floor, which you're a part of now, and when we have support functions, so a number of rooms located on the exterior perimeter here are breakout rooms, and that enables us to, to do different functions that collectively don't need to be done here in the room. If we need to do a traffic detour plan, we can send the traffic folks into a breakout room so they can focus strictly on, on that. Maybe it's a feeding program that needs to be accomplished, a sheltering uh, program that needs to happen, or a number of other complex situations. The breakout rooms serve an opportunity for them to do that. 
We have five levels of activation here in, in Williamson County. Level five, everything is normal. <clears throat> Nothing's going on. We're very comfortable. Level four, which is where we currently are, we're a level four monitoring for the continued COVID pandemic that currently is ongoing. It represents a minor activation and is usually limited in WCEMA personnel. Under level four, <clears throat> an event or incident has or is forecasted to occur and it requires a higher level of monitoring. So we've got some flooding predicted to come into our community over the next two or three days. Uh, we would immediately go into a level four to begin watching that. Again, it would be a limited number of our staff to constantly keep up with what's happening there and to make sure that we're giving out proper notices to our community and preparing as a community to respond to that, making our swift water rescue teams aware, making sure they're prepared and ready to deploy. A level three is a minor disaster. This room is staffed with key individuals from emergency management, as well as some from our, our cities and towns, depending on the area that's affected. And it also includes emergency services coordinators, which again are those representatives from various agencies. It is an incident that requires our close attention and explore events by emergency services and other key personnel to ensure that we meet our, our service and utility needs. Level two is a full activation. That's a major disaster that comes within our community and it's staffed with most, if not all, our emergency services coordinators and emergency management staff. It would typically operate at that time on a 24-hour continual basis in 12-hour shifts. <clears throat> it would greatly stre uh, stress, if not completely stress, all of our resources here in Williamson County and might require us to call in from other counties. And then of course, a level one is a catastrophic event where we're uh, very much debilitated as a community and we're gonna not only have to have mutual aid from surrounding counties, but we're also gonna have to likely have assistance from other states to come in and help us out. Again, like what Louisiana is experiencing. We also have our Joint Information Center back there in the corner. The Joint Information Center is where our public affairs officer and all of the PIOs from our different cities and towns, our hospital, our health department and others come to meet to talk about things, to monitor rumor control, to get information out, to get information in and to serve the disaster response. Next to that, we have a media briefing room. <clears throat> the media briefing room is designed so that the media can come into the lobby, go into the media briefing room, but they cannot get into the emergency operations center. And we as staff can go into the meeting without having to mingle out in the public lobby area and then come right back so we don't have to, again, intermix with the media as we go outside. We also have strategically placed curtains on this side of the wall so we can allow them to see into the, into the emergency operations center when we want them to, but not when we don't. As well as we have hookups on the outside of the building, although most are more sophisticated now and don't require that, they can hook up on the exterior of the building and get live feeds from that room out to their satellite trucks and then through their broadcast. We have the policy conference room, which is directly behind you. We affectionately call that the mayor's conference room. That's where all of the politicians and dignitaries across our community will meet to, be, to define policy level decisions for, our, for the disaster. And then we have our GIS I talked about, our geographical information center room. And then we have the OXCOM room, which probably you all are familiar with and have had a tour at some point. <clears throat> We also have bunk room and shower facilities. So we have the ability to house in beds six individuals within this facility. And those are mainly used by our 911 dispatch center when they have to stay over for uh, snow or ice conditions that may happen in our community, but can also serve the emergency operations center. And then we have a number of cots that can be spread out throughout this building to be able to house people if they need to stay over here on a 24 hour basis. Shower facilities again, we have a full kitchen uh, upstairs and eating area and within Williamson County our school system we have over over 50 schools across Williamson County and every one of them have full cafeterias and staff obviously for feeding their population they're also under a federal feeding program where they're required to provide food to anyone in need in times of disaster that's hundred percent reimbursable so they designed our kitchen upstairs uh, and, and they are the ones that actually staff, they send school staff over here to prepare meals for us 24 hours a day when we're fully activated in the emergency operations center. 
So we have county government, city government, utility partners, our private sector, which is key, key, uh, key personnel who can help us during times of disaster are in this room, our nonprofit and faith-based organizations, and of course our amateur radio operating group uh, are, are some of the examples of people that are located in this room during times of disaster, as well as our state and federal partners, uh, depending on the scope and magnitude of the incident. So how do we handle the disaster within this room? Well, we use what's called emergency support functions. And so we have our in infrastructure branch, which is responsible for transportation, that's our road network, communications, which are radio systems and our warning systems, infrastructure, which is our wastewater and water and bridge and building inspections, and then our energy section, which is responsible for our electrical and gas. <clears throat> That group will sit together at a table and handle all of those different issues that crop up and arise and also keep us informed about the status of those systems. We have our emergency services branch, which consists of firefighting, emergency medical services, search and rescue, environmental response, and our law enforcement partners. We have our human needs branch. And, and let me stress a couple of things here. It's hard to see on this slide. But the ones that are bolded, in this case, it's the ESF-2, the radio systems and warning. These are all areas where members of this group can help support the emergency operations center. Uh, so it, it, radio systems and warning systems are an area where you can plug in and help, not only during times of disaster, but daily as we test our systems and make sure they're functional and operational. <clears throat> in our human uh, branch, Human services, shelter and mass care is another area that this group could help provide some support in. Whether that's providing communications at our shelters back to this organization, or whether that's actually helping to manage a shelter and its functions. I say that many of you are familiar with American Red Cross, and we certainly want to rely on the American Red Cross to operate and run our shelters. But anytime we have a disaster, we have an immediate need to set up shelter sometimes for individuals. And it may take 48 to 72 hours or more for Red Cross to be able to get here and to establish those shelters, as well as depending on the scope and magnitude of the event, they may not have staff to staff a shelter at all. So we as a community need to be fully prepared to do that on our own. And that's one area that members of this group as an example could help with. ESF-8 is our public health and crisis intervention support. That is our EMS division, our functional needs, population, our mass casualty needs. Then we have food and we have animal housing and care services. And again, <clears throat> food and animal housing and care is another example of how this group could help support the effort in times of need. We have our planning and information branch is also another area. <clears throat> we have a limited number of emergency services across this community <clears throat> and they can't be everywhere across the community at one time. <clears throat> Collectively in this group, you're probably spread throughout Williamson County and maybe in counties surrounding Williamson County. And so the more people that we have reporting in about the things that are being encountered in our community, the more we can target the right resources and, and really get a situational awareness of how large the impact is happening to our community. And we're going to be developing a number of different apps uh, to be able to help you through smartphones or other devices report things. Closed roads is a primary example. Right now, we're still relying on the method of law enforcement calling in over the radio, someone documenting that road closed, and then inputting that into the system. When really, you ought to be able to pick up your smartphone, identify that this road is closed from this point to this point, and feed it real time into the emergency operations center, and in turn, allow the public to see that real time as it's occurring. So whether a road's closed or whether a road's open, it's extremely important for us to understand that, not only for the public's commute, but also for emergency services to be able to reach destinations that have a need of their services. And then recovery, <clears throat> disaster uh, relief assistance and reconstruction. And I, and I didn't specifically talk about damage assessment, but damage assessment is another area where this group could significantly help. To that was the emergency operations center and so this is what they were facing this is actually a downhill slope because we're underground here and you can't tell it's downhill slope because the water level is up to where it is but this is this was about 12 inches of water at, at one point that was in our emergency operations center there that again also had some pipe failures that were done additional products 
So it was a, a very a poor functioning, almost non-functioning uh, system. This was Tuscaloosa, Alabama in May 2011. This was their emergency operations center, and they were able to evacuate that building moments before the tornado struck this community, uh, this, this particular area of their community. Uh, but can you imagine trying to run a disaster of tornadoes that just came through your center when your emergency operations center is gone? <clears throat> so let's talk about this building. It's 56,000 square feet building designed to withstand impact levels and winds for an EF5 tornado, which is the most powerful tornado they could get. This building has enough steel in it, we're told by the architects, uh, to build a six-story high-rise building. That's how reinforced this building is. Even though it's rated for an F5 tornado, I like to say we've never tested that theory. <laughs> so uh, we're hopeful that if it ever happens that this building will survive, but they tell us it will. It's designed to work completely off the grid for up to 72 hours. And then we have provisions to be able to bring resources in to help some, some, uh, support longer durations, which I'll talk about in a minute. Video wall in front of it has 32 screens, allowing 16 individual feeds to come into that, those screens at one time. Whether that's newscasts, whether that's computers throughout the emergency operations center, computers in our dispatch center, computers throughout the building, or a host of uh, internet sites, we can bring them into this screen at one time. At the head of every table is a TV that comes out of the table, and it also can accept any of those feeds coming into that table as well, so that the table can focus on what's most important to them while watching overall situational uh, on the board. And then we have our individual computers at every workstation. We have 105 workstations throughout this room with 10 ESF tables, and then we have 15 workstations at the head table, which is where our branch directors sit, where the DACO and ADACO, that's the direction and control officer and assistant direction and control officer, those are the ones running and managing the room. And then we have uh, our recorder and some other organizations up here. Our GIS would sit up here, and our uh, technology person would sit up here. Building is designed at FEMA 361 impact resistance for a large missile level. 15 pound two by four traveling at 100 miles an hour cannot penetrate the exterior of this building. So we're protected from flying debris. If you went out and looked, and you may have at our emergency generators and our HVAC, they are all in fully enclosed and fully protected containers so that debris can't uh, take them out as well. We have two emergency generators. We have our third one that's on order. Each emergency generator is able to supply power to this building by itself. We have two now, and we're again, we're bringing our third one in. It's on order right now, and it'll be in later this fall. We also have uh, power that's uh, brought in from Middle Tennessee Electric by two separate substations. So if one substation gets out, power can be rerouted to another. What I don't like about the setup is all of our lines from both directions come in overhead. And so one event in this area could take out power from both substations without even affecting the substations itself. That's, that's a detraction for our center. Hence why we have our emergency generators, why it's important for us to have three levels of redundancy there. Then we have fiber optic connectivity on our main fiber loop, as well as an additional fiber connection from a separate location. We have, eight, we have three chillers, two uh, that have been here since the building was built, and we just uh, were in the process of finishing the installation on our third chiller to run the HVAC throughout this building. Our server rooms also all have portable air conditioning units that we can operate should we lose total power within this building of generator to make sure that our uh, many systems that we have in our in our IT closets are fully functional. Because of the rating of this building, not only does the emergency management have its redundant, uh, its servers and stuff in this building, uh, we, we up until recently, Middle Tennessee Electric had their disaster recovery center upstairs, but they've now built their own hardened building in another county and they've moved their resources. Williamson Medical Center has their disaster recovery center here. We're working with the city of Franklin to put their disaster recovery center here, potentially. Uh, we have our school systems that have their disaster recovery centers here. So, uh, and we have others that are in this building as well. Uh, that again are partners that help us respond to and recover from disasters. We have a 2,000 gallon inline water tank, and this water tank is something that's used every day, all day. It's not something that you just turn on in times of disaster. So we know that it's functional and it works, and again, we're able to bring in 
we were able to bring in a tractor trailer trial size generator to plug in immediately if, if our three generators fail for some reason. And then we have the ability to bring in potable water if we need to continue to refill our 2,000 gallon tank. But it will operate all plumbing fixtures within this building. So I'm just about finished. Upcoming initiatives. The uh, <laughs> emergency response team. I told you that our vision is for a community that's prepared, a whole community that's prepared. One way that you do that is through community emergency response teams. Many agencies and, and organizations throughout the United States have these groups of individuals. They go through a training program that's delivered. You can, you can do training programs on the internet. We can certainly deliver our own training and those kinds of things. There's a number of initiatives that take place in a community emergency response team program. And what this does is train the community on basic things that they can do during, not only during times of disaster, but daily during emergencies. Uh, whether a gas leaks occur, whether fires occur, uh, things of that nature. Trains you first of all to be able to prepare yourself and help yourself in times of disaster, your family, and then of course your neighbors. Uh, to, to be able to do things that eliminate the need for emergency services to come due. So you can help our center, you can help our community recover faster by addressing these things before they come, become major problems and allow emergency services to focus on the greater and larger things that are happening to our community. The problem with, an, with a community emergency response team for a community like ours is keeping people engaged and active. Because I told you earlier, we don't have a lot of disasters that strike our community. People go through this training and they actively participate and they never get to go truly help anybody and they begin to lose interest and fade off. So we're toying with the idea, I'm, I'm certainly struggling with the idea of a community emergency response team, but here is my ultimate philosophy. I believe that regardless if they fade and fizzle out or not, what they can learn within the program will help them through the rest of their life. And if we can empower more people to be able to understand what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, regardless if they ever have a disaster hit here, we're going to face local emergencies all throughout our community, where at some point, they're likely going to get an opportunity to exercise what they've learned. So we're, we're continuing to embark upon this, but if we do, uh, if we do decide to go forward with it, uh, then this is, that's what we're, this group can certainly participate in and help out. As a community, we tend to look at events as they happen. We don't typically focus back on what is the history of events showing within our community. Our job as emergency managers are to look at that. What is the history of events? When we look at the classes of times, so you get your weather alerts and they give you different things. They give you marginal or, or severe, these different types of threats that we're under. There's five levels of severe weather threats that the National Weather Service has issued. Five being the most significant, we've only had two tornadoes in Tennessee for a number of years now when we've been at a five. When we dropped to four, we've had about 15 to 20 tornadoes. When we dropped to three, we're up to 40 and 50 tornadoes. When we dropped to two, we're still in the 40 and 50s range. And when we drop to a level one, we're down to a 30, about 30 tornadoes. So what this tells us, first of all, is if you've watched any weather forecast, you understand that 90% of the time it's probably going to be wrong. Right. They're the only profession that can keep their job for continually predicting wrong weather patterns. They do the best they can with the tools and resources that they have, right? But we all know that tools and, and, and resources can't predict weather. And so what I'm telling you is the overwhelming majority of tornadoes that happen, happen in our lesser predicted states. And so any tornado, I mean, any thunderstorm is capable of producing a tornado. There's just conditions sometimes that make them more conducive. <clears throat> but you should understand that the last four tornadoes that have happened here in Williamson County, we have not been under a tornado watch, and we have not been under a tornado warning for the last four that have happened in Williamson County. And each one of those, with the exception of one, has did significant damage. They've all been EF zeros, so they've been the least uh, tornado that you can have, but an F zero will turn your car upside down. It will rip parts of your roof off. It will certainly injure or kill people. Fortunately, we haven't had any of those. But Jim Warren Park just a few years ago turned the car over with a woman and a baby inside. These tornadoes can be devastating. 
And oftentimes, people in our community rely on alerts and warnings. But if, an, if a tornado starts near you, you're not going to get an alert or a warning. Many years ago, the tornado that started west of Fieldstone Farms, if you know where that is, on Hillsboro Road in Franklin, it started about two miles west of Hillsboro Road. I was in the dispatch center at the time that tornado developed. The first report we got was someone from the mall, Cool Springs Mall, called us and said, a car just spun around in the parking lot. Still, we had no tornado watch or warning. That, that tornado continued to go northeast through Knowlesville and up into Nashville, and right after it crossed the line into Nashville is when the first warning came out. It takes time for it to be recognized and for the process to take place, and we're, we're naive if we rely on weather watches and warnings to always alert us. We should be cognizant of the weather that's happening. So those people at the baseball game, while we weren't under a tornado watch or warning, they knew thunderstorms were approaching the area, and they continued to play games as if nothing was going on. This is an area where we can help educate our community to be smarter. How many of you, when you get you're watching the news and it says tornado warning is issued for your cover or seat, uh, your area to seat cover. And the first thing you do is go to the front door and look outside and see, and see. <laughs> We're all guilty of it, right? So again, these are things we can help educate our community on. Can we get down there? This is another area and initiative that we are moving forward with, and this is what's called a Community Organization Active in Disaster, or COAD. Many of you may be familiar with BOADS, that's Volunteer Organizations Active in Disaster. That's usually a larger group, more of a regional-based group. A community organization is made up of local members of the community. Whether the, so I'm actively talking with one generation away, I'm talking with faith-based organizations. I'm talking with different partners that already provide various services during times of disaster to bring them together to form a Williamson County based coalition. That way for things like the event that happened in Grassland, we don't have to wait two and a half months in line for people to come help us out. We're prepared as a community to respond and meet those needs immediately upon the event happening. I do hope it was beneficial and if we can ever do anything to help you out, please let us know and 